Welcome, welcome. Hey, welcome. Hey, man. Hello, hello, everybody. This is Relax Time Radio from home. Um, <laughs> however, still broadcasting Radio Thailand Chiang Mai. It's Friday, so it's time for uh, life hacks with Paul and Mon. I just realized that I have, I've forgotten about things like shaving. Well, to a degree, anyway. Who cares? So, I, I, I don't. I don't care. But it's like you know. I just. I'm just looking at myself, so I'm really, I'm really in, in real time. Um, I think it's funny. You wear a proper shirt, and I just realize I'm like, oh wow, you can see my cupping marks, and you know. But it's um, just too warm. Well, I mean, here. I'm not wearing the shirt. The shirt just for the radio show. It's just um, the laundry is in the machine right now. It's one of the last things I've got to wear. So. Um, so this this show is uh, like the last couple of shows we're doing a sort of separate video thing and uh, radio version. So on the radio version, you're going to hear if you're listening to the radio right now, you're going to hear music, and we're going to start the music up quite soon with some uh, well with people to be as usual, and the rest of it's going to be newly released music. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, what you'll see is just mine and Mon's conversation. And what are we talking about today, Mon? Um. I thought, <laughs> actually, it was really hard to choose a topic for today. So my first uh, first um, try at choosing a topic was how to cook bats properly. But maybe that is too soon of a joke to make right now. So we decided to go with actual, uh, you know, traditions, food traditions, weird and funny ones. And... Um, all funny and funky facts about food worldwide. So that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. Um, I just realized that my microphone wasn't in there properly, but you could hear me anyway, right? Before. Yeah, totally fine. Uh, <laughs> now I might sound a bit different anyway. Um, so yeah, that's the topic of the day. Crazy food facts um, from around the world. So looking forward to that. And uh, if anybody wants to listen to the music um, down there, there's going to be under in the description of the YouTube video, it's going to be a playlist. So you can just listen to music. Um, I've dug around for uh, the best new music I could find. Amazing. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, let's get into it then. Um, yeah. Yes. Crazy facts about food. <laughs> let's well, start with sharing our own experience about food that we like ate on travels or been offered or some type of traditions that we encountered um okay um well i I've, I've learned thai so some of the craziest things some of the most interesting things for me are the names of thai food it used to uh, um baffle me there so some for example, there's one uh, dish which is um, a very spicy grilled beef salad, and it's called Sua Rong Hai, which means crying tiger. Oh. So, and like on Thai menus, you know, these days, uh, maybe there would be like more sort of explanation for tourists and things, but I would see all of these crazy things on the on menus and never know what they meant. Um, you know, I would have to ask, obviously, what, what these things are. So there are lots of, let me think of uh, some more examples of this. Um, mm, are there others? Um, well, I'll come back to that in a minute, but um, yeah, that's one of the things I used to love, the different names of food um, that you can't really, ha really you don't give you any idea of what the food itself is, like crying tiger. Um, I love that one. Yeah. Although I would never that's even try because I'm so allergic to chili, so I would probably be like, oh, the tiger's gonna cry from it? Nah. One nah. of my favorite food facts about, um, which is like pretty common knowledge now, I think, but one of my favorite food facts about, you know, Asian food in general, Thai food especially, and other um, spicy foods from around the world, is that the uh, chili is um, sort of, um, relatively modern introduction because the origin of the chili like many many different um, fruits and vegetables is south america so before um you know before those european invaders went to south america and uh, uh 
you know, took stuff from there or brought stuff from, from the Americas to Asia and Europe, there was no Chile. And so until the, let's say the 17th century, 16th, maybe late 16th, early 17th century, there would definitely have been no Chile anywhere in Asia or Europe at all. Oh, that is and interesting. So, and this also partly explains why um, the Thai word for Chile is, um, well, there are different, I mean, there are different names for different kinds of chilies, but just prick is chili, but prick Thai is pepper. And pepper is native to Asia. So the, you know, black pepper, like white mm -hmm. pepper. So this has been around and that's actually really spicy. And um, uh, here's, here's a good one. A tour guide, when I was first, brand new in Thailand, a tour, <laughs> I was at um, Swindok, Swindok Temple on Sutep Road mm -hmm. with, uh, with a tour guide. And there was a bush in the, in the grounds of the temple. And he said, oh, here, try one of these. And it was yeah. just a, like a, a, a clump of, um, well, I didn't know what, I, I didn't immediately understand what it was. And I ate it. It was incredibly spicy. Fortunately, I'm good with spicy food, but even for me, that's really, really spicy. And it was just a clump of um, fresh, like black pepper. Wow. But I'd, nev I'd never eaten it fresh like that yeah. before. They're green, right? When you pick them off the bush? Yeah, green. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they are, sometimes they're orangey as well, but um, yeah, oh. mainly green. Yeah. I would have yeah, so died. You got, you got me. You got me good. <laughs> How about I you? Yeah, I remember. Um, so I started traveling when I was 19 years old. So it's very funny, actually, the history of my food intake, let's just say that. Because when I was a child, I would eat anything, anything and everything. And then over the time, because it was a, a due to my medical history, it was just gotten a little bit. Uh, exhausting that if I didn't if I wasn't able to um, digest it probably or with all the medication it just didn't go well I was just not able to hold on to the food so I decided I just go with the food that I know and that is you know that I know that I can hold on to but then as soon as I started traveling I was like well what's the point of traveling if I don't eat all of the food and try new things right so I started trying new foods again. So I remember I went to um, to China. I think it was in uh, mm, maybe in 2011 or 10, something like this. It was quite a while ago. And I remember eating a soup and there were like little, like, uh, meatballs in there and I was asking them what it was and they said it was seafood so I was like fine you know and mm -hmm. then we were sitting it was a little fisher village where I needed to go like one and a half uh, hours outside of Shanghai so I was sitting there and I was eating a soup and then another waiter came and he's like oh you like turtle and I'm like yeah I love them like they're cute like I love seeing swimming them here in the river and everything. He's like, no, 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 you like turtle? And he points to my soup and I'm like, mm. um, no, N yes. Obviously I said yes, because you know, you don't want to really offend. And I immediately just dropped the spoon and I almost cried because I really love turtles, but I love them alive. <laughs> so that was the first thing. So I ate the whole soup, but I left all of the meatballs out, although it was over for the turtle anyways already. So that was one of the things. And then I had like on every kind of market I went to, people tried to convince me to eat um, the hundred year old egg. Yeah. And for the sake of, for the sake of my life, I could not, I could not get close to it. It was so smelly for me that it was, I mean, I'm really sensitive to sounds and to smells, not taste so much, but sound and smell. So I got close and I was standing behind a little crew and they were buying it and actually they just unpacked it. 
and oh my god it made me run away <laughs> so i was like no nah, i'm definitely not gonna try that one <laughs> I need that quite a lot, but uh, you know, like that's another one uh, the name things. So that's uh, a hundred year old egg in, in Thai. It's not called, it doesn't translate to that. Literally the, the name for it in uh, Thai, unless I'm getting mixed up is um, Kayuma, which means hospi egg. <laughs> it and smells like it. I'm sure. <laughs> I was, well, I don't know. I think it might be that these were once made using ho hospi or something. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. Like, yeah. So anyway, they're the hundred-year eggs, right? But they're in Thai. They're called basically hospi eggs. Maybe <laughs> it's dog pee eggs because I don't see so many horses around. Right. Well, yeah. I've no. I have no idea. I. I. I've been told about the origin of this, but I've like forgotten this. Right. But, yeah. Oh my god, imagine. Uh, th th I mean, Thai food's like, Thai food's uh, super interesting. I was trying to look up some um, history of Thai food, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, Thai food comes from lots of different influences, you know, Chinese, uh, Indian, um, and then the different sort of ethnic groups, etc. Um, all. And and the regional, you know, regional Thai food is like also different from each other. Um, I, I remember reading once about, uh, well, like uh, so some of some of the name, yeah, again, some of the um, Thai food have like an origin in the in the way that it was served. So, for example, you can find all around Thailand, kwetiau um, lua. Kwetiau lua means it basically means boat noodles. And that just comes from the fact that the the noodle this is a kind of noodle that would have been served from a boat on the on the canal, you know, back when Bangkok. Well, there are still floating markets in Bangkok, yeah. right? There's still a floating market, but Bangkok was once all sort of floating. Um, and then there's other canals, you know, around the country. So that's that's a kind of noodles. It's called boat noodles now, but that's hard, that was hard for me to understand at once. But then you actually. Uh, at the front of a lot of these noodle shops that are called with the Aulua, they'll have some kind of boat, um, you know, so that it looks like so it looks like they're selling it from a boat. That's really cool. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember when I was in Vietnam <laughs> for the, I think for the first, no, not for the first time, but for the second time, um, I went on a day trip with my colleague there when I worked there, and. We wanted to eat um, bun cha, which is a very traditional um, kind of noodle soup with uh, curled beef in Hanoi. But it's not very common in other areas of um, Vietnam. And we were quite a little bit away. And so, <laughs> so um, I just chose anything on the menu and we both so he's from the philippines i'm from germany so we were both like we didn't speak much vietnamese um we didn't have any internet there was not uh any um internet connection on our phones right so we were just like you know what we're just gonna go through the menu and just pick something so <laughs> i went for again a soup i think maybe i should stop <laughs> picking random soups but i picked the soup and i was really sure that what i picked was um something with pork and uh whatever else and then i got it and i was like well it doesn't look the way that i thought it's gonna look like and so i started eating and i was like that pork is not very well cooked maybe i'm not so sure and so i ate it all i almost ate it all and by the end we actually asked what it was because i wanted to make sure i eat first and then i ask and so she got her phone to say that and <laughs> it was all the intestines you could have from mm. from the pork well i got the pork right but like it was literally stomach, it was the intestine, it was like everything, you know? And I was like, well, now I know that is great. <laughs> that's, that's one of those things that's um, generational though. Like, so for example, um, yeah, a, a lot of, I, 
yeah, Thai people will often think that foreigners don't want to eat. And it's true, a lot of foreigners don't want to eat all the, all the intestines. Mm -hmm. But when I was really young, you know, my, my dad, my parents had grown up in the north of England, like a, a very poor part of the north of England, after, just immediately after the Second World War. And they, they were, they grew up on intestines. There was, there was nothing else. There was still, they grew up, when they were little kids, there were still rations in the UK. Um, and all of the different, there were lots of different dishes that my parents do, and my grandparents even more so, that were all different intestines and cow tongue, every tongue and feet and every everything was eaten so yeah. that's a kind of generational thing like a lot of maybe europeans now think of you know we don't eat intestines and whatever in europe we did def we definitely did not very long ago you know right it's just it's just a generational thing we still eat liver and it's really good the way my dad cooks it um yeah. and it's really healthy apparently well all, all the most famous um british pies are still things like steak and kidney and uh oh, yeah really? and there's still yeah maybe um hearts and duck hearts and this kind of thing they're all still yeah yeah i i've seen a lot of like the chicken hearts in brazil literally on the stick and they would just eat like that and i'm like maybe <laughs> maybe not today <laughs> <laughs> they're very um, high, like they're very nutritious compared to ordinary meats. Like I, I heard about right. people who, um, yeah, people who got stranded at sea, you know, for too long without any food. When they, when they catch something again, like a fish or whatever, or, that they immediately want to eat the brain, the eyes, the organs. They don't, yeah. Somehow, like there's some instinct in us that tells us that that's where the good, good stuff is. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what's the the weirdest. <laughs> Or maybe even a little bit for for us and our uh, perspective, grossest or funkiest food you've ever eaten, or part of an animal or animal. Um. Well, I mean, we're living in Thailand. I've eaten everything. You know, there, there are several um, dishes that are pork brains and fish brains. Um, uh, this is really common. People are. Uh, um it's many people's my my wife's some of my wife's favorite stuff i've eaten it you know it's all yeah that, but that's i don't even know if that's weird anymore it was when when i was a kid and i saw indiana jones eating stuff out of a monkey skull it seemed weird but now <laughs> none of it seems weird anymore i tell you what still seems weird for a, a lot of people and i remember is finding very strange um is that in malaysia they have a, a desserts they love desserts in malaysia uh, and they make a lot of different ones, but they have a, a lot of desserts which mix salt and sugar. So you'll have like, for example, let's say you have a bowl of um, coconut milk and there's some bananas in there. So, and they do, so they have, they sort of put the, maybe they'll put the sweet base first. Is that right? Yeah, they might. So they might put the sweet sort of mix first, um, coconut and banana. And then in the middle, they'll sort of like put in a scoop, a spoonful of, um, very salty, um, I don't know, like a rice pudding or something. So yeah. for 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 me, the first time I tried that, I couldn't it couldn't go together in my mind. Very incredibly salty and incredibly sweet mm -hmm. going together. But uh, in that's yeah, so the, yeah, like the different the different ideas of what flavors can go together around the world. That's mm -hmm. maybe to me that's maybe more shocking now than the idea of eating a particular animal's brain or something. Right. I think the the funkiest reactions when I talk about uh, food with friends or whatever is when I tell them that I tried testicles. All that was also more oh. a, a miss, you know, like one of those. I picked this on a menu and I didn't know what it is, and then by the end, I, well, I had both testicles on the plate. <laughs> that's that still works. That's still that's still surprising. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> and. Yeah. Um, first time in Thailand for me, 2014, I obviously ate um, tarantula, scorpion. Mm. I've and never done that. No, I've eaten insects, but not, not spiders. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, it, it's something that I think um, most tourists do. And because in, I literally, I came to Thailand and I was like, okay, I'm going to live here. 
and I'm going to be a scuba dive instructor and whatever by this time. So the first weekend I knew I'm just going to be a tourist for a weekend. So I literally, you know, I got to meet a bunch of backpackers literally and we went through Cow Sun Road and whatever you need to do as a tourist. And I got to see Chinatown, whatever. And literally they, they were like, oh, we got to, we got to eat insects. I'm like, fine. But then they bought scorpions and tarantulas. And I, I was, there was my sticks in the hand and I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to pretend it's some type of salty crackers or whatever. And it went fine. Um, a bit crunchy though, but yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, how, like I, I mentioned that, um, this is this is more fact fact based and less crazy. But I mentioned that um, Chili's came from uh, South America. I remember reading the like the book Guns, Germs, and Steel, which I which I think is by a German author originally, mm-hmm. like a German anthropologist. Forget his name. Um, but any, anyway, it's um it's incredible how many of the crops, fruits, and vegetables that are worldwide made sort of things came from south america and some of the things that have come from there are you know potatoes are from there pumpkins pineapples papayas uh um yeah cocoa obviously chili right? um let's see what else um do you want to have a look from, at the map i will well I'm, I'm looking at this map now yeah so from north america raspberries and blueberries cranberries strawberries um there are some, there are some, like the only thing that this doesn't tell is there are some things that are from, that are in multiple places, but, um, cause like I'm seeing here that grapes are native to North America, it's saying, but, uh, oh. I'm assuming that they're not only from there cause they, that wouldn't yeah, make think, sense. I think a few things probably have been spread across the world a little bit already. Yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously a lot of different things are native to um, Asia. I'm just like loads of veg- loads of vegetables, bananas and cucumbers and eggplants and things. Um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose the reason why South America is the surprising one is just because it's the one. It's like, well, it's what we call. Uh, it's what gets called the New World, isn't it? So, in other words, like the, for. Um, even though there were people living in the Americas for thousands and thousands of years and domesticating crops. Like I, I didn't realize how long, how old domesticated crops in South America were, but apparently it's like at least 10,000 years. But um, it's just that that part of the world was cut off from the rest of the world, Asia and mm. Europe and Australia and Africa for so long until only the last 500 years, right? In, t- in terms of like trade. So, yeah. so many, so many of the things that just seem like the fundamentals, like for example, tomatoes, that seems like a fundamental of Italian food to us, right? But really? they didn't I exist. thought it was Spanish. Uh, no, tomatoes are from, from um, the Americas. Oh, really? Well, I, I mean, you know, tomatoes are fundamental in lots of different cuisines, but you, when you, you, I think, uh, well, and, and past and, um, where people know the story about Marco Polo, right? Pasta obviously comes from China. Basically, it's basically the Italians' attempt to recreate noodles. And then the tomato sauce, which is the base of the, so many of Italian right. sauces, is also yeah. not from not from Europe, really. Yeah. So amazing. Um, what you know, interesting stuff did you find out about? Yeah, so we have uh, researched a bit about really funny or funky or weird food and crazy food facts. So let's um, let's share a few of those, should we? Yeah. So I think, um, oh yeah, I'm going to start with that one that I've read that before already and I share it with a friend of mine. I was just a little bit confused um but i think it shows just that the world obviously doesn't work the way that we think it works so strawberries are actually not berries technically um 
you know, they're actually um, a fruit. And because um, apparently berries need to have little stone seeds or seed stones or however you want to call them. So that would mean that, for example, watermelons and pumpkins and bananas are berries, but strawberries are not berries. And I thought that it's just too confusing for me. <laughs> um, yeah, that's an, like, I keep seeing this kind of stuff. Now I, on, on this like fact that you just said, saying that um, a banana is a berry, whereas I'd, I thought I'd heard that bananas were a herb. What? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. Well, the, apparently the technical term berries is used for any fleshy fruit produced by a single ovary. Ah, oh, now I'm looking. So, like the internet says that the banana is actually a herb and a berry. A herbal berry? <laughs> it's a herbal berry, yeah. <laughs> What, how is it a herb? Um, it's a herb because, uh, let's have a look. It's, it's a herb because it's a herbaceous perennial. In, in other words, the plant itself is it's not a tree. The, the, the thing it grows on is basically like a herb. It's a her, herbaceous perennial. The, so that banana tree that looks like a palm tree is now a herb. But well, the banana that, that, that the, looks like, you know, this huge kind, like that's a berry? Okay, well, now we know what's yeah. wrong with this world. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, apparently the banana can be thought classified as a herb and a berry. That is so funny. Yeah. All right, tell me one thing that you found. Um, well, this is one that I really liked because when I was young, there was um, something called rhubarb growing in my garden and oh, I used to yeah. love it. Very, very sour, but I would eat it with sugar. sugar. Um, and apparently rhubarb makes enough noise when it grows that it can be heard by the human ear. So in actual fact, you can hear rhubarb growing. It really? does grow incredibly fast, but apparently, yeah, you oh, can actually this hear is it so growing. Oh, cool. Um, I, when I was young, I got told that rhubarb was from uh, China, and so when I was in China, I like I tried to find it, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Yeah, it is. It is originally from China. Oh, we had it in Germany all the time. My mom would do rhubarb um, cake. <laughs> My grandma would cook um, rhubarb crumble, which is like. I don't know yeah. if you know what a crumble is. Yes, it's yes, like, yeah. basically. That's what I mean, yeah. 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 I love yeah, that's, that. That's, that's my favorite, yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, the cra I think the craziest fact of all, for me, the craziest fact of all that I found are the craziest two facts are um, about cheese. So cheese oh, yeah. is apparently the most stolen food in the world. And uh, some... As someone's estimated that 4% of all the cheese made is stolen. Um, <laughs> and then you could like wonder why that is. Well, some of it's very expensive, high value, so that could be one reason. But another reason, in my view, could be that it's been found that um, cheese uh, causes basically dopamine release in the brain. Mm -hmm. So, which is, so it basically, it has compounds that break, um, called casein that break into break down in your body into casomorphins and these you know cross the blood brain barrier and uh, you know give you a dopamine hit which is basically what opioids do so and that that does make sense the people that like cheese they'll definitely recognize the addictiveness of it and it's it is it is basically ad addictive and it's one of the foods that's most easy to crave so I, I wonder if that's connected with the fact that it's the most stolen <laughs> food in the world. Maybe. Mm. Um, yeah, I love that. Imagine, <laughs> imagine someone just goes out to steal cheese. I mean. Yeah. Um, 
All right, so so um, I found, yeah. Well, I have something if you don't have anything. Yeah, no, I found something that I thought was really funny because you were just talking about just um, how cheese can be kind of like a drug. So nutmeg, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, nutmeg, nutmeg the, yeah. The yeah, the spice, spice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> if you ingest a really large dose of it, um, it works like a hallucinogen, hallucinogen. Um, because it has a natural compound which is called myristicine. And so apparently it has mind altering effects if you take it in really large doses. It must have to be a really large, I would imagine. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably more than most people could stomach. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of, uh, speaking of, I don't know if it's narcotic is the right word, but speaking of something that has mind altering effects, beer and wine have an incredibly ancient history. And every time I like to research it, I keep, I keep seeing stories which pushes back the, the date. Um, it's basically, you know, it's known that beer was made in ancient Sumeria, ancient Egypt. It's at least, it goes back at least uh, seven or 8,000 years and possibly more because there's been found to be like sort of remains of fermented, you know, fermented residues that could have been used to make beer even like 13, 14,000 years ago. But one of the things I like most about it is that, um, you know, there have been various different studies showing that animals love to basically get, many different animals like to get drunk as well. So it is, um, monkeys will monkeys will eat as much if they find a fermented fruit or alcohol like many different kinds of monkeys will drink it or eat the fruit until they get drunk and fall about all over the place and elephants your favorite elephants yeah they will yeah. they will get they will get drunk they'll eat they love fermented um which particular fruit corn, is it yeah corn wine yeah they love yeah. like um rice beer um and they'll eat sort of overripe palm fruit mm. um yeah and, and they'll eat well elephants eat lots of all sorts of stuff but basically they'll eat enough to get drunk as well well so, they eat all day long <laughs> yeah they eat all day long yeah. i love that um i found one thing that is maybe not just a food fact itself but there was a study that was made actually with tomato plants since we were talking about tomatoes and mm -hmm. it was it was conducted in a uh, basically in a garden house where they were um, growing under best conditions, and so they would actually try um, if music would be able to help them grow and also um, speaking to the plants, which I thought was really interesting. So it was found that classical music is the best music for plants in that case to, um, tomato plants was the best and that like some type of heavy metal would actually make them die <laughs> and, really? yeah. and also it was really really crazy they had literally two different sets of plants and one was like three times a day was talking down to like literally just you know blame chained and screamed at and yelled at and whatever it was really bad language and the other one was being encouraged and braced and you know it's just like as you would try to raise a child yeah, yeah. And i that, read about these studies yeah and that yeah. plant would would grow really big and basically gave more tomatoes and the other one some of them died as well and others would just not even grow they would stay really really small and i thought that was so interesting that it even works for plants because it certainly works on humans as well so um yeah there's a there's a documentary called The Secret Life of Plants that Stevie Wonder did the music for. And this, this documentary is like really crazy. It, um, um, there's even, there's much more crazy things about plants than, than, than this. Um, I can't remember, like I watched it so long ago. What were some of the things in there? Uh, uh, yeah, well, actually, some of these things have since been backed up. So there was this research done by... Um, this guy in Chicago and then a Russian scientist did quite a lot of research and this is back in the 60s or 70s like showing that 
plants fear um, people that are coming to cut them. But actually, recent, re recent research has backed this up that um, if you basically, if you, ha if you bring people into a room you can, and you sort of like put electrodes in the plants and measure some sort of uh, responses from them, that they react, respond differently to a person who's been known to cut them down. So I, I don't know, take this with a pinch of salt perhaps, you're gonna read, read about it for yourself, but there seems to be some suggestion that plants uh, have a fear response to people who they know are going to hurt them. Right. It's right. crazy I don't know because how you would, yeah. I also read that there is a so-called stress response from plants and you should actually stress out your vegetables before you eat them. I'm like, I don't know how to stress out my vegetables. Apparently oh. they they um, produce more uh, more of some type of um, chemical that is good for us. But you have to, before you pick the vegetables, actually stress them out. And I thought it was really funny. But now that you talk about this study, it makes kind of sense um, if that was actually the truth. I just read that from, an, um, you know, it was a nutritionist kind of a doctor yeah. and, and he said like you should stress your vegetables and I'm like um I don't know how to stress my vegetables <laughs> there are there are lots of yeah um there are other sort of uh studies showing that like plants communicate with each other right and they communicate with uh you know their neighbors in fact like some plants now there's this um now there are these studies that are showing that uh, trees like neighboring trees will sort of maintain the root system of, of, of um, an old tree that's been sort of cut down yeah. uh, you know in other words they'll keep this the sort of friends if you I'm just using words like friends but the neighbors let's say of yeah. a tree that's been cut down will sort of keep the root system of that tree alive yeah uh, and other other crazy facts anyway plants plants are amazing uh, we know very little we're learning more um, they communicate and so on yeah um yeah and yeah. Uh, one of my favorite one of the my favorite things i learned uh is that some plants especially some certain cacti and some mushrooms they're um responsive to um cosmic radiation so in other words um in other words there are some plants that only respond m mainly to you know daylight frequencies normal normal like day frequent light frequencies and so that if you put them in a box or put them in a cupboard, they will stop responding to the day night cycle. They won't know if it's day or night, but there are other plants, including the one called the sensitive plant, which is a cactus. And you can take them uh, a mile deep under the earth in an old mine shaft and they still respond to the day night, day, um, night cycle. And it wasn't known how they did it, but then until they found a way to, in, in actual fact, if you go even deeper, if you go something like two miles deep, then you then you start to block off some of the cosmic background radiation, so mm -hmm. cosmic rays from space. But basically, these plants were responding to um, the day-night cycle by using this, because, for example, the the cosmic rays can penetrate quite a lot of Earth, but they can't penetrate the whole Earth. So the plant's able to work out, you know, from this, right? Where, where, yeah. That is insane. Mm, incredible. I love that. I, I Thank, suppose we've gotten a bit tough topic there. That's not, <laughs> food, that's not food anymore. But with yeah. plants, it's related. Yeah. I have a funny one here. Well, I think it's funny, though. <laughs> we will see how funny everyone else think it is. So if we look at honey, then it's actually, if we go really blunt, it's like bee vomit. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, because they actually collect all of the nectar and then swallow it into whatever, if they have a stomach or however that looks like inside. And then they regurgitate that whole thing and spit it back onto the hive. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just a word, isn't it? Vomit doesn't sound very nice, but then... Yeah, I'm sorry. Look at all of the things that we... We, we, we were talking about <laughs> eating intestines and things a moment ago. I yeah, think, I mean... You know, apart Apart from the word vomit itself, that doesn't sound any worse. Than 
right and vegan definitely not um and yeah. I think it's really funny because if we're actually looking at it, right, like, I mean, maybe that's just me, but especially in the past, like, maybe in the past 10 or 15 years, looking at my food intake, like, I did eat fast food when I was a teenager, like, when I was 15, 16, I would eat a lot of fast food pizza, burgers from all of these fast food chains, and then uh, kebabs, you know, I love them. But now I wouldn't eat any of that unless it's like a homemade pizza for example but um when i look at it like i'd rather have if we want to call it bee vomit or intestines or you know a bull testicle rather than all of this processed food that a lot of people have at their homes in western cultures because let's be honest yeah there i don't even want to i want to make this this is like uh, controversial, but on the other hand, in my mind, not really controversial. So one of the facts on, you know, this website, crazy facts about food is, this is a fact saying that, did you, did you know, you know, the term healthy foods cost up to 10 times as much as junk foods? Well, I want to dispute that. I mean, it may be true that, you know, going into an expensive whole foods shop in America costs more than eating the junk food from somewhere nearby. But I don't think that's a fair comparison because, for example, you know, I read a book called The One Straw Revolution about this organic farmer in Japan. And he managed to, he wasn't just an organic farmer. Um, he, was, uh, he was basically growing crops with as little effort as possible. He wasn't using any machinery. He wasn't using a mechanical plow. They, they, weren't, even plow they weren't even plowing the land. He was just scattering seed. It took him a long time to develop this method to learn about nature enough um, but basically the, so he was growing completely organically without modern machinery and his yields were the highest in, in Japan. So, and the, so in, in that case, and the input costs were like lower. So he basically was saying he could compete growing the way he was growing organically, um, with any farming system in, in Japan. And there's, you know, I'm translating the books of um, John Jandai here in Thailand, and he, he's basically saying you can you can grow your you can grow your own food, um, and you can grow it basically for free, and you don't need to buy fertilizers because you can use, um, um, uh, you know, uh, kikwai, uh, bu buffalo buffalo dung, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, this kind this kind of stuff. Um, so. And in places like, you know, England, there's an allotment system that was used very much during the world wars, you know, World War One, World War Two. Um, uh, in LA, they have a gangster gardener. He's like quite famous, Ron Finlay. He's an interesting guy. He started planting food on the streets of Los Angeles. And at first the police started to try to arrest him, but he got so much publicity that, well, yeah, because they were saying he doesn't own the land and you can't just grow food anywhere. But it was basically, abandoned land you know um so i would definitely dispute this idea that healthy food has to cost 10 times as much as junk food um especially if you have to but right i think it's yeah. also a, a matter of as you just said right you didn't own the land like a lot of people who live in a city they just don't have the place they don't right. have they probably don't have the time we know how time works you know or yeah, they don't I, make I, it a priority. I, like there's a lot of things, but I don't, I understand where you're coming from. But I also think like, I mean, I've been to America and I went into a Whole Foods and I bought literally a pack of pineapple. You know how much I love pineapples, right? And they were cut yeah. up. So they'd done the work for me, thanks. But I literally didn't pay for the pineapple. I paid for that person to cut the food and it was done already. But I paid, get this in your hand, 17 US dollars for half wow. of a, not, not one, half of a pineapple. And shall I t try to tell you how it tasted? <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. Like chemical water. I was like, I was looking at it. I started crying because really not for the money, but for the pineapple. Pineapples are supposed to be amazing. And it was just crap. Right. Seventeen dollar crap apple. That's crazy. Crap. Yeah. Yeah. That's really crazy. And so uh, I understand a, how people think, you know. That is sorry, you go on. 
no, no. Well, I was just gonna. Here's here's a fun one. Um, this this is one. I don't know if I'm gonna fact check it. It's supposed to be on a. It's a you know, it's on the same site that we're getting these other fact types from. Um, apparently, the origin of the sandwich is from a dude called the Earl of Sandwich, who was a gambling addict who didn't want to leave the the table to eat while he was gambling. So he sort of came up with the sandwich so that he didn't have to. Uh, some, I, I don't know how this, it, does, it only sort of makes sense, doesn't it? But here's this, apparently the sandwich comes from the Earl of Sandwich, John Montague, who was on a 24 hour gambling streak and sandwich helped him to stay at the table and not have to get up. It sounds like didn't, a smart idea to me. Yeah. I like sandwiches. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Doing enough again. Um, here's a funny one that I definitely didn't know. According to this, you cannot overcook mushrooms. If oh. you if you if you oh well, I did know that you can like yeah, you can lightly cook them and you can keep on cooking them and they reduce down to very very small size. But according to this, there's a special polymer in cell walls of mushrooms that mean that it will still remain tender no matter how long you cook them for. Mm. So, so it will still have like nutritional value and still be okay, <laughs> even if you massively overcook, massively apparently overcook them, leave them on the stove. I literally mm. don't eat mushrooms unless they're raw. Mm. Hmm. Maybe that's a reason. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Should we do our top three? Yeah, we should. I think because we've um, been going for 15 minutes now, I think we can definitely do a top three. Okay. I might have used all my best ones already, though. Uh, sure that doesn't them. matter. That's fine. Just not sure I saved going. anything. Yeah. Okay. Top three, huh? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think, you know, one of, one of my... One of my top three, I definitely already said, which is the, the cheese is the most stolen food in the world and also is one of the most addictive foods in the world. It produces, you know, dopamine releases in the brain. There's one. Um, here's one that I kind of like and I didn't know. You know how people like to think, imagine that some animals are totally useless. Like people, what's the use of mosquitoes? What's the use of flies? Well, here's one. Without flies, there would be no chocolate. Um, apparently, oh. there's a certain species of um, Microsoft, microscopic midge that lives on the fly. Um, and without it, the, the pollination of the cacao plant wouldn't happen. So with that, without flies, there would be no chocolate. There you go. That's two. Uh, what's, my, that's, what's my last one? Hmm. Let me see now. Oh, uh, this is this is a good one because I've been wondering about this. I'm always like getting annoyed by the stickers on um, fruit, apples, and things. And apparently, they're they're made so that they're edible. Not that you'd want to eat them, but apparently, it's, and I don't know if this is like worldwide. So you better not just uh, take my word for it. But the, this this website. A website is telling me yeah. that the stickers on fruit are edible. Wow. But also mm. the glue and everything, I wouldn't want it. The, the glue, it. I mean, they must, be, they must be using, they couldn't put toxic glue on, on a piece of fruit, could they? I mean, surely. But anyway, apparently the whole thing's edible. Interesting. Mm. Hmm. Was it three? Uh, someone, however, a mm. user comments on this said, said they're plastic and they're not die biodegradable. I have. So he knows this from, from having tried to compost them. Yeah. So there you go. Take that with a pinch of salt as well. Yeah. I think That's in three. some countries, actually, they may have edible ones. Um, yeah. I, we can't take this for granted that it's worldwide. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So I have one and I think it's really funny because it actually, um, happened to me in one or the other way 
so in uh, in South Africa, but not only in South Africa, it's in other countries too. Um, the popcorn that you get when you are going to the cinema is actually roasted termites or ants. Oh. Yeah. Really? Yes. <laughs> And I run. I trying to remember where that was. That I actually wanted to buy a bag of popcorn, and they said like, um, someone told me it's ants, and I was like, well, okay, maybe not today. <laughs> but that was really funny for sure. Um. Then um, <laughs> they have really funny ones. Well, the um. Oh, I think one one food tradition. I'm gonna put a food food tradition. It's not my favorite because of how much I like it, but I think it's just uh, it it's just it's just so weird. Um, but it's just weird because obviously it's different. So in mm. Vietnam, um, if you're invited to like a business meeting, really with high level uh business uh people and or to some type of um, you know, to some type of really big family get together or something like this, where some person is really honored to be there, then they will get a living snake, cut them open, get the heart out, the beating one still, and they will fill the blood into little like um, shot classes. So the most honored person to be there which is then maybe you has to eat the beating snake heart as an honor um and then you are the most honorable person there and everyone else drinks this warm snake blood and i thought does that like, happen to you no, no but almost i got out before i That's had to go out yeah <laughs> because i really love snakes as well i know i love i love weird animals but I really love snakes, you know, and I was like, I could not do that. I could not, because they also cut them open at the table. But apparently that's now not anymore a daily thing. That's really just a once in a lifetime kind of experience now. But it was a very traditional thing. So I thought that's, um, so that's number two of a very weird way. And what's number three? Hmm. You know, actually, I'm going to choose a Thai thing because I really love it. And many people are so, like, shocked when they do that the first time. So, you know, when you buy fresh pressed orange juice, you always get it with a spoon of salt. And, yeah, you get extra sugar and, and salt and, and some probably some lime in there, or like lime juice yeah. as well. Yeah, right. And it's also with your tea. So if you order tea, for example, you usually also, they always put a spoon of salt in there. Um, so for example, if you get like the cream tea with lemon, right, instead of the milk, you just don't taste the salt if you have the milk teas, like the chan yeah. or the cha kiao nam or whatever. But if you have only the cha kiao manao, then they put the salt in there. And because I always drink without sugar, you can definitely taste it, but I think it tastes great. And I also, um, I, I'm used to a lot of salt from Germany. We use salt for like, we use more salt than food, I guess. Um, so I didn't even recognize it, but my friend drank it with me together and he almost spit it out because it was so salty for him. And I thought that was really funny, but I like it. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I never came across, that's funny, I wonder why I never came across that, like the iced lemon tea, yeah, that's, I've only ever had it with sugar, it is like very intense, it never, it just, somehow it never occurred to me that there was salt in there, Yeah. I, I, I knew, I always knew it from the fruit juices, but they, I didn't know yeah. that, so, yeah. Did you also know why they do it? <clears throat> well, I just know that in Thai cuisine, and Thai, like Thai, they, there's just this very strong belief in the balance of flavors, you know, sweet, salty, sour, um, you know, and then chili if it's food that's meant to be spicy. So I, I, other than that, I had no, is there anything else? Well, I was told when I first came and I asked why they put the salt in there also for the flavor, but apparently they do it for um, the electrolytes as well. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. But if that's the truth, I don't know. But one Thai person told me, oh, we put always a little, little bit salt uh, for better electrolytes because it's so hot, you lose a lot of um, mm. liquid. So, you know. Right. That makes sense. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that electrolytes have salts in them, but I don't know if it's the same, just one kind of salt, the same kind of salt. Or I well, you would need to have like Himalayan pink salt or whatever. Like the yeah. ionized salt, the table salt doesn't help you much. But yeah, that's just mm. my salt knowledge. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's pretty much, um, I think we've gone, gone far enough. What, yeah, what do you definitely. Think? All right. Well, well should we say goodbye to everyone? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Um, goodbye from me. And Mon. All right. And goodbye from and Mon. You're uh, here. Thanks very much for. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you do it. No, 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 no. You go. I'm just too late, or you are too late. <laughs> it's, it's a slight delay, isn't it? It's like yeah. our microphones cut out at different times. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. Well, all right. Thanks very much for listening to Mon and I. It's been Relax Time Radio on Friday. No idea what date. Let me have a look. 23rd of <laughs> April. Yeah. I could, could have been anything. Um, 24th of here Yeah. On Radio Thailand, Chiang Mai. Relax Time Radio is still going every night of the week, 7.30 to 9 p.m. It's been good to have you with us. Uh, once again, um, the playlist, if you'd like to just listen to the music, is down there. All right. And see you next time. I'll be back on Sunday for the Jazz Blues and Soul Show. Tomorrow it is Kun Tom with the Legal Matters show. Um, possibly uh, it, Tom, Tom's been covering um, not just Legal Matters lately, visa things uh, as usual, but also COVID-19 updates and this kind of thing. So check that out tomorrow. And we see you next time. Good night. Bye. Thanks. See you next week. <laughs>